Ah, okay, finally, you're going to get to knit. And we're going to start with an open cast on. I want you to get two green cards, and you are going to insert them behind the needle butts on either side of zero. This should give you about 48 stitches. Now, I know some people who can get 50 stitches, but today we're just looking for 48 stitches. Okay, that stabilizes those. The next step is to lift the weighted hem, find the center of that hem, which is conveniently marked for you, where I had this wonderful little white thing I was going to stick through there. There it is, that little hole. Can you barely see that? Okay, that goes right over zero. This is, for me, one of the most challenging parts of bond knitting. But that's because I wear glasses. Okay, once those are separated, lay it on top of the bed and get your pull cord. Today I am using my favorite pull cord. It's good luck. And you also need to make sure that all of these latches are open. Miraculously mine are, but this is my absolute favorite tool for opening latches. It is a credit card and it has a V cut out of it and it has been folded, sort of tent style. It was brought to me by a student who's also a teacher, Arlette Wentz over in Bellevue, Washington, and it is a wonderful device. What you do is you set it into that and you run it along there. It opens those things as slick as anything. I don't care what tool you use, it's just important that you not use your fingers. The ends of those needles are very sharp and I don't don't want you to catch your finger and then when you move your hand you rip it. Okay, now we're going to lay the cord into the open latches. I will retrieve my big pile of clips which I've been hiding from you so it doesn't look so messy around here. Hang a clip from either end. Lift the weighted hem up. Okay. Fold it over. Oops should be just about roughly in half. Okay, now I want you to push that up against the bed and remove the green cards. Now this is where you are instructed in your bond books to use the yellow card, but I prefer to take right now to teach you what half knit position looks like rather than relying on that aid. You take your green cards and very gradually push these needles back until the latches just barely touch your cord. Okay, now see if you can see that. Those latches are barely touching the cord. Now, the carriage mechanism. Once our weighted hem is hung, it is time to get out the carriage, which fits over the back rail and drops forward. We're going to be using a key plate three, three today, and I want you to make sure that it's waxed. I showed you how to do it before. Mine has done, be, been done beforehand. The key plate slips in this way. It's very important that you get it under those pips. Can you see that? There they are, those little pips right there. You slide your key plate under those. Okay, then you pick up the handle, the bond facing you, and you are ready to knit. I'm going to get my yarn. Today I want you to use the darker of the two yarns that you brought to class. And you remember in your instructions on the outside, you were to bring two worsted weight yarns. I'm going to give myself lots of slack. I am going to thread this through both eyes of the carriage. Okay, make sure it's down there. Then very gradually move this across. Make sure all of my latches are open, and they are. With good hard downward pressure, I might want to grab onto that thread for the first couple of stitches. And there I have cast on my first row. When you have a yarn end, always attach a clip. The bond knits with weight going in that direction. You have the weight hanging, but this bitter end doesn't have any weight. Okay, and now you're going to learn the four rules of bond knitting. They are, first of all, that the yarn coming through the handle slot must be exactly free-flowing. And one other thing I have to do first, I forgot this. You have to put your fabric guide on. If you don't put it on now, you're going to make a loopy mess. The advantage of casting on without the fabric guide is that it doesn't get hung up on the weighted hem. The disadvantage is you might forget before you go on again. When this slides in, it is very, very important. There it is. It clicked in. See that channel right along the side there? 
if you'll be able to wiggle it a little bit and you'll be able to feel if it's there. Okay, now that the fabric guide's back on and we're safe, let's go back to the four rules. The yarn must be totally free flowing. Second of all, as you start a row, you have to pull the carriage, the eye of the carriage, push it rather, until the eye of the carriage is right over the end needle and then you pull up the slack, drop it so that it's free flowing. Two hands is rule three and move slowly across the carriage is rule four. Full slack, come to the edge of the knitting, eye over the end needle, drop your yarn, all the slack is pulled out, two hands and move slowly across. Okay, one more row. Oh, notice I'm breaking the rule. I'm using one hand, but you do that after a while. I am now going to show you how to use claw weights. They are the one accessory that I think you ought to have right from the beginning with your bond. Because your knitting wants to get narrower, it's hyperextended on these needles, which are, have an eight millimeter pitch. That means there's eight millimeters between them. If you do not put the claw weights on, as it grows, it wants to narrow. It pulls in to get to its natural size, and that end two needles, those end two stitches, have uneven tension. If you hang these claw weights on, it helps to compensate for that. I'm gonna hang these right up and under the edge, right at the very edge of my knitting. That's the rule, up and under the edge of the knitting. Okay. And there's one other thing I wanted to tell you. You know I said slow. Slow is a pretty relative term. But just know that the bond was designed to knit an inch a minute, and that's pretty much fast enough for anyone. Okay, now I want you to stop the tape, cast on 48 stitches with an open cast on, and knit 12 rows in your best good rules of bond knitting. Then rejoin me. Okay, fine. Now that you know how to knit on the bond, it seems only appropriate that you should learn how to rip on the bond. Now, it may sound silly, but there are times when you're following all your rules and the cat stages a surprise attack on your ball of yarn, or in my case, I'm always leaving the scissors right in the way so that my yarn tangles around the scissors and it gives me too tight a tension row. The solution to that problem is very easy and you will be happy to know this. You start by grasping the yarn at the same side as the carriage and you pull. Notice that I am pulling absolutely parallel to the floor, parallel to the bed, and I, don't be afraid of it. I have one student who thinks I'm so rough with yarns, but I'm not. And I, oh, this one started to lift for me already. I'm just lifting all the way across. I sometimes use my hands to stabilize the butts of the needles. Now the end stitch is just a little bit tricky. To get it off, I just kind of, whoops, grab it, there we go. You can look at it, I'll move my claw weights down. You can see if you've ripped out that end stitch. Okay, on the way back, again, you pull parallel to the bed, don't be afraid of it, get it taut all the way across. It, there is one important point that I want to make, and that is if you rip out this way so that your needles are away from the bed, they can be bent. I actually had a student who bent her needles by not keeping them nice and close in. Well, let's make sure I didn't get any behind the latches. There we go. Continue, oops, all the way across. Lift. Nice and smoothly till you get to the other end. Bring it around on the outside and usually poops right up there. Boop, there it is. Sometimes I drop it, but you know, drop stitches are like drop pencils. They're not gonna go very far. You just stop and pick them up, despite everyone's fear. And a third row all the way across, which I don't have to finish right now. You're the ones who have, oh yes, I guess I do, because I wanna show you something. It's along about this point in my beginning class that the students say, oh, we have to knit it or rip another row because our yarn is at the wrong end. Oop, there it is. Our yarn is coming off this end of the carriage and our carriage is over here. How do we solve that problem? It's simple. You remove the handle, take out your key plate, and run that carriage all the way across. It's not going to hurt anything. When you get to this side, now notice my yarn 
hooked over one of those needles, so I had to be careful. When you get to this side, reinsert the key plate, just as you did at the beginning. Put your handle back on, and then start pulling, because you have a ton of slack to pull up. Make sure it's not wrapped around your fabric guide. When you're in front, you can tell better. Don't let it get hooked up on anything. Pull it right to the end needle, and you're ready to knit again. I would like you now to rip three rows, move your carriage across, pull the yarn back in, knit those three rows, and turn the tape back on. Now that you're making it so well, you ought to know what it is that you're making. It is stockinette fabric, and the bond makes it faster and better than anyone I know, and, but anything else beyond stock and knit fabric, you need to, what we say, hand manipulate it. You have to do something with your fingers and some of the tools. This is stock and knit fabric. Notice that at the top and at the bottom, it curls toward the front. On the sides, it curls inward. The reason is that the front of the stitch, or the plain side, or the knit side, is a slightly different size stitch than the back of the stitch. The proportions are very, very tiny, but it's different. If you make something like this, don't think that you've done anything wrong on the bond. This is what it's supposed to look like. However, in order to get nice flat edges that don't roll, that's when we mix knits and purls. And over here we have seed stitch, for example, which has an exact number of knits and purls in it. It's knit one, purl one, knit one, purl one, and then it's staggered over that, knit one, purl one, knit one, purl one. Garter stitch, which is knit every row by hand knitting, is also a perfect combination. This is garter stitch going off in this direction. This is garter stitch that was done with the garter bar on the bond. Notice all of those lie flat. Also, this rib, which is knit one, purl one. Again, as long as they are balanced, then your fabric will lie flat. Now, the stock and knit stitch is based on not a square gauge, but a rectangular gauge. These little stitches are like little building blocks or bricks, and they look like this. Usually the proportion is they are three quarters as high as they are wide. And that doesn't seem very significant until you are working, for example, an intarsia piece and you want to do a circle. If you graph it on square paper, you're going to end up in trouble because it'll sort of squish down into an oval. Gauge is a very complicated subject, very interesting complex subject. When I want to measure inches per, or stitches per inch, excuse me, you measure in this direction. And rows per inch are measured in this direction. Now, um, I compute all of my gauges to the nearest tenth of a stitch or tenth of a row per inch. It doesn't sound like much if you're a half of a stitch off. However, if you're trying to make a 40 inch sweater, 40 inches around, and you are using four and a half stitches per inch gauge, if you go down to four inches or four stitches per inch, you end up with something teeny tiny. It's 35 and some inches. I left the calculation someplace else. If you get three and a half, or excuse me, four stitches per inch, anyway, a half either way, you can go up to 46 inches around. So it's very important that you compute it very precisely. This lends itself more to writing than it does to speaking, and I recommend to you Key Plate News number 15, which has my article called The Vagaries of Gauge. It's affected by things like the color of the yarn, how much weight you have hanging from the yarn. Um, the speed at which you knit actually can affect your gauge. So that should also appear in the best of 88 or tips and techniques from 88, and you can refer to that. Well. The bond by itself is great at making these curly things, but they look rather like stringy dust rags. And as a teacher, I had to make some assumptions. And my assumption was that you didn't want to make a pile of these squirrely, curly, stringy things. Instead, that you wanted to make sweaters.